Father in heaven, we are now about to open your word. It's your word. And we truly believe that without you, we can do nothing. We can't even understand this. So we pray that you will be here to teach us. <clears throat> you will impress upon our mind and heart what it is you want us to know and to experience. We pray that everyone here will hear from you and that everyone here will be preparing for an eternity of living with you. Bless, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. We'll be studying one verse today. Luke 12, verse 32. I will be reading it in the New King James Version, and that's also what will appear on the screen. Jesus' words, he says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, some context. Jesus is in the region called Perea. It's the area of Jerusalem, or Israel that is east of the Jordan. It is four or five months before he will go to Calvary and to be crucified. He is spending time there. He is teaching there. There's actually a lot of print in the book of Luke about what Jesus said during that time. We are, we've been picking our way through it. Some of it is repetitive from what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew. We've been through that, so we're not going to read and study every single verse. We have done that already. But this comment that Jesus makes is in response and part of a question that was asked him. Jesus was preaching and he was interrupted. Verse 13, then one from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. From that passage, we studied the parable that Jesus spoke regarding the uh, rich fool. We <clears throat> studied for several weeks the concept of coveting, how it is idolatry, and how awful it is to our well-being. I promised you last week we would have two more sermons about it. I think that might be one of the reasons our attendance is down today. I'm not going to do that. We had two sermons on it. If you don't get it, uh, preaching two more times on it is not going to make a difference. And besides, I'm tired of the topic. And so I wanted to go on. And we are. As I was reading and looking for a message from God... Verse 32, jumped up, waved its arms, and said, Preach me! Preach me! And so I'm going to. And you will see in one verse that there is an amazing depth of material here to be of benefit to us as we walk from here to the kingdom. So we're back in Luke 12, verse 32, Jesus' words, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, I am not good at English. My wife has spent 46 years teaching me how to speak. She corrected me this morning. I was pronouncing covetousness, and she told me, no, covetousness. And I appreciate that. When she married me, I couldn't really talk at all. <laughs> now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to be funny. This is serious. When I was in training to be a pastor, our main instructor said, if you don't have it, marry it. So I married an English teacher. <laughs> and she's helped me tremendously. But one thing I've learned in listening to her is sentence structure is very important in conversation and also 
in writing. Now, there were theologians that I read this week who said, this is a bad sentence. And it reminded me of what an English teacher might do with this sentence if a high school student handed in this sentence, typical English situation, do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. A teacher may have read marks all over it. There are actually three figures of speech in one sentence dealing with fear. Do not fear. There's a mention of a little flock, which implies a shepherd. There's a mention of a father, that implies a family. There's a mention of the kingdom, that implies a king. And an American English teacher might say, that's not a good sentence. You need to focus on one of those and then have a different sentence for each one of those. But in the Middle Eastern mind, the mind that Jesus was speaking to, this sentence made perfect sense. The common point was that the head of the flock is the shepherd, the head of the family is the father, the head of the kingdom is the king. And in this instance, the kingdom is an eternal kingdom. So the people in Jesus' day would have heard this as a single focus, the head of. In fact, if you are asked to do a devotional to a group of people sometime, you can use this verse. And you can use four words to dissect this verse. You can say fear, flock, family, forever. It's all there in that verse. Now, as I was studying this verse, I was intrigued by those three heads of the flock, you know, the shepherd, the father, the king. But what really intrigued me is the first two words, fear not. That's an imperative statement. You're not, or do not fear. In the King James, it's fear not. The New International Version, do not be afraid. Living Bible, don't be afraid. The Amplified Version, which takes the Greek word and feathers it out for us, do not be seized with alarm and struck with fear. I got thinking, you know, I really don't have a good working biblical definition of what fear is. What does the Bible actually say about fear? I know Jesus tells us many times, don't fear. But what does it mean and how does it apply to us practically? So I looked up the Greek word, which is phobio, which is a word that comes from phobos, and our English word for it is phobia. That sounds very familiar to us. But depending on the context, it has a rather wide spectrum of meaning. So the context determines what the meaning is. It can mean to put in fear. It can mean alarm or fright. It can mean exceeding fear or terror. It can mean in awe of, that is to revere or reverence. So depending on the context, that's how we determine what the meaning is. And what I discovered is what I'm going to share with you today. When it comes to the word fear, the concept of fear, Fear only has three faces in the entirety of the New Testament. Three faces. In fact, had I given the sermon title later in the week, instead of shepherd, father, king, the sermon would be the three faces of fear. And the way I found these, so you can know how to study the scriptures, is in the Bible, the first mention of a word is very important. So when you're looking at a word, you always go to the first mention. And I did that. And then I learned. So then I decided, well, there's only about 20 or 30 uses of it. Let's look at those. I went to the second mention, and I learned. And then I realized these are two distinct faces of fear. And then I decided, well, let's go to the last one after I perused all the ones in between. 
And the last one, the last use of the word fear is entirely different than the first two. So we have three faces of fear, and that's what we're going to look at today. The first one is found in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, a story very familiar to Christians and non-Christians alike. It is the story of Mary and Joseph. They are espoused to one another. They're engaged. Mary comes back from being with Elizabeth. She's been gone three months, and she comes back three months pregnant. And she's telling Joseph about the baby that is to be born and tells Joseph that God himself is the father of this child. Well, you can understand Joseph is confused. He doesn't get it. And he has decided to stop the marriage that will be coming. It's called a divorce in some versions of the Bible, and it was a divorce in their culture. But he's going to put her away privately. He's not going to make a big public scene about it. He's a decent fella, and he doesn't want to embarrass her. So she's at home. He's at home. He's got all the turmoil going on inside of him. And an angel appears to him and speaks to him in verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Do not be afraid. King James Version says, fear not. The Living Bible says, don't hesitate. And we see the face of fear here is to be filled with concern over an unwanted situation, to have uncertainty, to have apprehension. Do not be afraid because of the uncertainty of your situation. Why? Why not be afraid? Because this thing is of the Lord. God is with you. So the first face of fear that we see is the uncertainty of situation. We all have it. We've experienced it. You may be going through it now. You certainly will have some in the future. What do we do? What do we do in this circumstance? Oftentimes there's confusion, there's doubt, there's apprehension. Many times there are sleepless nights. What do we do? Do not fear. The Lord is with you. Now, the second face of fear is entirely different. We go to Matthew chapter 10. And I'm going to read a number of verses here. They all come together, and you'll see why. Matthew 10, beginning with verse 16, words of Jesus, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, here you go, do not fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Do not fear men. First one, do not fear situations. The second one, do not fear men. Do not fear what men can do to you. Do not fear what mankind can do to you. 
these people, Jesus' disciples, were being sent out like sheep among wolves. Do not be afraid of them. He goes on to explain further. Verse 27. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. Here he comes again. Verse 28. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Do not fear what men can do to you. Joseph uncertainty of a situation. Do not fear it. The disciples, fear of what people think or what people can do. God created us social beings. It's a driving force in our existence. We want to be accepted. We want to be loved. We want to be appreciated. We want to be one of the gang, if you will. It's a part of us. And sometimes the fear of being different for what people might say or do causes us not to be faithful in our walk to the Lord. It's a very dangerous thing. And so the Lord is saying, look, you're going to have situations, you're going to have uncertainty, do not fear. God is with you. You're going to have situations where you're going to have to take a stand for what is right, what is true, what is honest. Do not fear what people can do to you. Yeah, they might kill you, but they can't cast your soul into hell. Fear him who can. That's our third fear. God. Fear God. And when we come to this part of the study... The fear of God, think of it as a coin. It has two sides. Two sides. There is a good fear of God, and there is a bad fear of God. Let's look at that. Revelation 19, verse 5, the very last use of the word fear in the Bible. Revelation 19, verse 5, it says then, a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you whose servants and those who fear him, both small and great. The Amplified var Version of the Bible simply says, Reverence him. It means to be in awe, to revere or reverence. To be in awe means profound, humble reverence inspired by God. It creates a submissive and admiring fear inspired by the authority, power, and love of God. There are two sides of this fear. One side is a healthy, good fear. The other side is the fear of condemnation. Because God is the judge. God is holy. God is the standard. And God will hold us accountable. Adam and Eve demonstrated this type of fear. They sinned, they felt naked, they felt ashamed, they felt guilty, they tried to cover themselves up with fig leaves, and the minute they heard God enter the garden, they ran to hide from him. The fear of condemnation. God through the plan of salvation has taught us how we can be delivered from condemnation. Through his holiness, his majesty, his power, his love, and the grace and the gift of salvation, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, there is no longer any condemnation. We no longer run from him we run to him. And the fear we have for God is that reverential awe. Whoa! God loves me. God is my shepherd. God is my father. God is my king. Wow been thinking about 
this relationship with God. And oftentimes in Scripture, it is likened to a marriage. You know, you can have two people that are married, and they can be afraid of each other for what they can do to harm each other. Do you know that a healthy marriage, the couple will determine they will never intentionally hurt the other one? They will hurt them because they're imperfect, but it's much easier to ask for forgiveness when it wasn't intentional. There's the fear that they will embarrass them. Some people fear that they're going to get beat up by the other one. This is not a good relationship. But in a healthy relationship, there is fear as well. And it's the fear that one would do something that would hurt the other one. Because love seeks to do no harm. And so a healthy fear is a thing of the Lord. But it's not running from the person, it's running to them in support. And so God's people are described as having that healthy fear. They have been delivered from condemnation. And they rejoice in that love and freedom from guilt and shame. And they run to the Lord. They want to be to the Lord. And that's why the Bible describes when Jesus returns, you have some standing there looking up saying, Lo, this is our God. We've been waiting for Him. We've been waiting for this day. And you have a group running to the caves, hide me from his face, calling on the rocks, roll over me. I don't want to look into that face. I'm afraid because they're condemned, because they refused the salvation offered to them in Jesus Christ. So, I want you to look at Luke chapter 12. Verse 32. Let's read this out loud together. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not be afraid of situations. Do not be afraid of what people can do. And do not be afraid of condemnation if you are in the Lord. You see, there is a flock. You can be in it. There is a family. You can be in it. There is a forever. You can experience it. Shepherd, father, king. Some of you may have a father that's not worth a hoot. Maybe he was evil. Don't worry about that one. Think of the shepherd and think of the kindly king. You'll get to the same spot. But God, it says in verse 32, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God has personal joy in giving you the kingdom. And my question today is, is there anyone here who would like to say, Lord, I want to receive that kingdom. I want it. I want it in my heart. And by your grace, by your grace, I want to quit fearing situations. I want to quit fearing people, and I want to quit fearing condemnation. If you want to say you want the kingdom, please stand. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for your love. Thank you for the plan of redemption. We ask for Jesus to be our Savior. 
We pray he comes into our heart, that he establishes the kingdom there, and that we have the hope of eternity flowing through our thoughts and feelings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.